Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are here together, um, the Canadian Mountain Network and Reconciling Ways of Knowing to host a delayed um, seminar for International Mountain Day 2021, which we had postponed due to um, the passing of Elder uh, Dr. Dave Corshane, who was one of the conveners and founders of the Reconciling Ways of Knowing Forum. Before we get started today with the panel discussion, I just wanna start with a few things to make sure that we've got our technical um, components of the session um, taken care of. So we've turned off the chat feature and we're gonna ask you to use the Q&A at the bottom um, of your Zoom screen to put your questions in. And when we get to that portion of the session, um, the moderators behind the screen will help make sure those questions come to the audience. Um, the speakers are going to be on different Wi-Fi connections today, and their volume and um, resolution on their screens may change. Um, we have people joining us from all across Canada and some really remote places, so we appreciate your patience as we work through the world of Zoom. The session should approximately be one and a half hours. It may run a little bit longer than that, um, so um, you'll be able to stay for the remainder of the session with us. We are also recording this dialogue, so anyone unable to participate in the entire session can still view it later and we'll have those links available. I wanna offer greetings to our panelists who are joining us today. We have indigenous elders, knowledge holders, scientists and learners, and we have you, the audience, joining us from across the globe. I'm joining you today from Edmonton, Alberta, situated in Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of many First Nations and Métis peoples. Members of our panel and the host teams are situated across Canada. And I would like to start by acknowledging that we are on the ancestral lands and territories of numerous and diverse indigenous nations. And we pay tribute to their heritage and legacy as we strengthen ties with the communities we serve while taking concrete actions towards meaningful reconciliation. We recognize the historical trauma and triumphs that many different cultures, lands and nations have continuously faced within Canada and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work with Indigenous communities in advancing their vision and aspirations on this land. We pay respect to all Indigenous people from all nations across Canada. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers and honour their leaders. So thank you for joining us today for this International Mountain Day event. I would now like to introduce Elder Mary Jane Johnson Gudia, who will provide the spiritual opening for today's event. Gudia is a Kluan Mun Kudan elder who worked for Parks Canada and Kluani First Nation for over 40 years on protected areas, environment, cultural, and Indigenous language issues. She's a champion for Indigenous language revitalization while partaking in a community that actively lives their culture. She contributes to an objective perspective to several boards and committees and sits as an active committee member on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission Report Response Task Force, the Asikai Natural Environment Park Management Plan Steering Committee, the Pick Handle Lakes Habitat Protection Area Steering Committee, the Canadian Mountain Network Research Management Committee, the Canadian Mountain Assessment Canadian Advisory Committee, and the Dan Kai Renewable Resource Council. Gudia is retired and is a happy and busy grandmother of 11 grandchildren and one great grandson. Thank you, Gudia. Mary Jane Johnson. Ama Tutlesson Uye H. A. Ama Guch and A. Lena Johnson Uye H. A. A sua good dear Uye H. A. Na. A sua show E. Na Uye H. A. Na. In my people's way, uh, my name is Good dear. Uh, in the English way, uh, Mary Jane Johnson. My mother is Tuthlesen. My grandmother, who I am named after and who has passed, is Gudia. And my great-grandmother on my mom's side is Ina, and she has passed. 
by rights, I should be introducing on my mother's side and my father's side as far back as I know. And this way you will know how I was raised, where I come from, and how I carry my name from my clan through the generations and have the honor of carrying that name in my lifetime. We would like, as, as Nicole had stated, to acknowledge that each of us are located on unceded and ceded lands of the First Nation nations, the Métis nations, and the Inuit nations across this country, Canada, and maybe other places in the world than the, the people of the land there as well. There was an elder from Teslan, her name was Virginia Smarch, and she said in very easy words to understand our place on this earth, that we are part of the land and we are part of the water. We are each caretakers of the lands and the waters on which we gather. And as more people travel around the world and settle into the gathering places of the First Nations, the Métis and the Inuit, there will be stress on those places. To be good caretakers, we must respect each other's ability to learn from the past by being present today for a future where our strength will be each other. Our legacy will be communities where all the peoples have a place to be curious, playful, intelligent, industrious, creative, strong, where the winged, the finned, the four-legged, the two-legged, the rooted and flowing, all continue to thrive to be part of the next seven generations. I wanted to share one uh, last thing here that um, uh, as we think today in our conversations that um, if we could step back from how we look at our land area of, of, um, of, and the waters, um, if we can step back from thinking of maps and, 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 and the alphabet of the written language and how both have viewed our, uh, the ways that we view and interact with the land and, and with the water. Um, if you can think back to some of the first guidance from your grandmothers, um, your Asuas and your Asiyas, your grandfathers, um, think back to um, um, how they were speaking to you about place. Most of them were not speaking to you with the map or book in hand. They were using their internal navigation, their teaching and their sharing of stories of their knowledge and land and how to care for that. And that care has been passed down to you if you remember their words. We ask that, um, uh, as we all come together here, almost like a, a big potluck, all of our trails all leading to where we are sharing this time and, and energy together in our lifetime on this day, that um, we continue to think about and care for all those that are in need physically, emotionally, spiritually, that we can uplift all of those people, making sure that ourselves are cared for as well. That's all for now. Thank you, Gadia, for opening our day in a good way. Today's event is in recognition of the United Nations International Mountain Day, started in 2003 to bring recognition to the global importance of mountains. This event is centered around the theme of sustainable mountain tourism, the United Nations theme for Mountain Day 2021. 
we had previously scheduled this for early December last year. And as mentioned, we, we have postponed it until today. I do want to also highlight that 2022 has been declared by the United Nations General Assembly to be the International Year of Sustainable Mountain Development to increase awareness of the importance of sustainable mountain development and the conservation and sustainable use of mountain ecosystems. As well, 2022 is also the 20th anniversary from the first international year ever devoted to mountains, International Year of Mountains 2002, as well as the 20th anniversary of the Mountain Partnership. Mountains cover 27% of the Earth's surface and hold almost half of the world's biodiversity hotspots. And these spectacular landscapes attract 15 to 20% of global tourism. The effects of tourism combined with the continuing impacts of climate change on these special and sacred places means focusing on sustainable tourism is more important than ever. And sustainable tourism is a broad topic. Today, we hope to discuss the role conventional tourism and ecological and cultural tourism can play in building resilient economies, supporting indigenous self-determination, fostering reconciliation while working towards sustaining and recovering biodiversity. And to have this meaningful conversation, the history and significance of these lands for Indigenous peoples must be included. And we must be ready to participate in discussion together with Indigenous knowledge holders and scientists, elders and youth to understand and care for these lands with multiple ways of knowing and doing to support these fragile spaces for the next seven generations. The speakers we have here today are from a diverse range of mountain regions across Canada, and each of them are working to support mountain sustainable tourism through their knowledge systems. Rather than read their bios to you, um, I'm going to have each one of the speakers uh, introduce themselves in their own way and their own experience I'm going to pick on them one at a time to do this. So first, I'm going to introduce Kiljuice, Kiel, Kiljuice, Barbara Wilson. Barbara. Hello. Thank you. Kiljuice Panadakidaka. I am Kiljuice. My English name is Barbara Wilson. I'm from the Haida Nation, and I today I'm sitting on the um, territory of the Simsian coastal people. I would like to acknowledge them. And I would also like to acknowledge the people who um, have been through extreme trauma over the last day or so with the knowing of another residential school and, and the children that have been uh, found in the gr unmarked graves around the Williams Lake Indian Residential School. I am also um, a residential school survivor. My family, because of the laws of Canada, um, were all taken to residential schools, including our father. And so when we talk about all these parts of our lands, we have to keep that in mind the impact that has happened to us. Part of what I, what I want to introduce myself as is a great grandmother. I have two young great granddaughters and I have five grandchildren. I have four, grand, four children and I am the oldest female in my clan. And I am also a teacher. I've um, spent 23 years with parks, but I retired 10 years ago. I just finished three years on the board for the archipelago management. So I've been very involved with tourism since 1967, which is uh, a long time ago. But um, I'm I'm very pleased to, to have been able to contribute to my nation. We've recently just put um, a pledge together for the Haida Nation's land base and ocean. And we've also put an orientation together. So when you come to our lands, 
um, we're asking you to read our pledge um, and follow our, hopefully our directions that are respectful of our lands. So my involvement with mountains, you know that islands are mountains. They're the tops of, of mountains. So we work very hard to protect our lands and our waters. And we are, are very aware that people love to come and see islands because they usually hold endemic species and different things. So we want you to feel that you can come to our islands, but we ask you to observe and respect our guidelines for, for existing or visiting our islands. Um, sustainable uh, tourism is, is almost a, um, what do you call it? They don't work together. They're, they're like this sustainable means of- Oxymoron maybe. <laughs> Pardon? An oxymoron. Yes, and and so when we look at when we look at tourism, it's about looking after the land. And why are we looking after the land? In our old days, uh, we would have been taught to respect the lands, not to take more than we need, and and to always think of others and the the generations that come behind us. So. Uh, we have lots of learning to do here in Canada. So, Hawa, uh, Nicole. Thank you, Barbara. Now I'm going to ask Bill Snow to introduce himself. And I'm supposed to refresh the, the topic as well as you introduce yourself. Um, can you give us some background on your experience and um, what you're doing, working towards conserving cultural and natural heritage. Thanks, Bill. Uh, thank you, Nicole. Ambo Stitch. Good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Bill Snow. I'm the uh, uh, acting director of consultation for the Stony Tribal Administration that is representative of the, the Bear Spa, Chiniki, and Wesley First Nations. Uh, in, And I'm uh, currently here in uh, in Winchispa, Oyade, or as we otherwise know it as Calgary, Alberta, and uh, speaking to you from the Treaty 7 area, that is the ancestral home of the Stony Nakota people, as I said, uh, uh, that comprise of the Bear Spa, Chiniki, and Wesley First Nations. I uh, would also like to acknowledge our historical and cultural ties uh, to the Tanaha and Shushwap Tribal Council uh, in BC. Uh, we have a long and, and fruitful association with, with tribes there. Uh, in Treaty 7, I would also like to acknowledge the Sutina First Nation, the Siksika, Pekani, and Blood Tribe that also uh, are part of the Treaty 7 area. Uh, also, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, Métis, Métis Nation Region 3, and would also like to acknowledge the, uh, all of our brothers and sisters in the LB, LGBTQ community uh, who may be uh, watching uh, uh, part of our presentation today. Uh, I'll be speaking a bit about the uh, bison reintroduction uh, uh, project. Uh, I think there, there are really uh, important and strong ties to uh, uh, tourism and conservation uh, Stony Nakoda is working on a uh, cultural study for the, uh, the for the bison uh, reintroduction project, and we hope to have that uh, released here soon in 22. And uh, we'll be talking how these uh, relate to uh, historical uh, themes around uh, tourism and conservation. Nish, thank you. Thank you, Bill. I'm now going to turn to Norma Cassie, who's also uh, our co-research director for the Canadian Mountain Network. Welcome, Norma. Thank you. I just want to say hello to everyone out there. I'm happy that you have joined us today. Um, yeah, welcome. This is this is uh, interesting times, and um, I just want to say welcome. So happy you guys are all here. Uh, good day. I'm uh, from People of the Lakes. 
my which in name is one who care who has gives away their last cup of tea and i am also a grandmother uh, i got 11 grandchildren uh, two of them are great grandchildren and uh, so lots and lots of responsibility <laughs> and um I just want to say that uh, I'm also part of the Indigenous Leadership Initiative, um, a whole bunch of incredible leaders across Canada who are working towards building uh, Indigenous protected and conserved areas, and also to build, build upon the network of the land guardians across this country. And um, also as Nicole said, uh, co-director of the Canadian Mountain Network, along with Marie Humphreys and our other incredible team of the Canadian Mountain Network. So good morning and welcome. Thank you, Norma. I'm now going to turn to Isabel Falardo, who is joining us from the east side of Canada. Merci, Nicole. Bonjour. Um, hello, everyone. Um, Thank you for uh, everyone who's been speaking before me, especially for the very touching um, introduction to our talk by Gudia. It was uh, really, for me, really meaningful. Um, and um, and um, following that, what I think brings us together today, um, or part of what brings us together today is a shared attachment or love for mountains, uh, certainly is what I um, and bring in with me today. Mine was passed on to me by my father, Jean. Um, he brought me in his backpack, skiing in the forest when I was a baby. He brought me um, skipping school on, on, on fresh snow days as a child. And those very special moments um, really shaped my life. Um, and uh, wanted, and, and now <laughs> I get to pass that on to my own children. <laughs> and um, so uh, it, it also made me want to pursue um, that great feeling of being in the mountains and being in nature through my life and made me, um, so I'm in Quebec City, uh, not known for being a mountainous region. We do have mountains, uh, but it made me uh, want to live in different mountain areas around uh, North America, um, including Whistler, Aspen, um, and then now um, that that life, that life in the mountains became, has become part of my identity through my professional life. Um, it gave me a sense of belonging. It also uh, introduced me to what, how great and how bad tourism can be. Um, and uh, I'm now, I'm back living in Quebec City. Uh, and uh, since I've been back um, about 10 years ago, I've uh, started to study uh, sustainable tourism uh, as an undergraduate at first and um, somehow put my arm in the uh, in the <laughs> machine and now I'm just about to uh, end a cycle and defend my thesis on on Friday um, that's um, concerning tourism sustainable tourism and in innovation and authenticity in tourism and so I speak or, or participate today as a uh, as a student, as a researcher, I'm also a professor at uh, Université du Québec à Trois-Rivières, where I, I um, teach and study uh, leisure and uh, local, uh, local tourism or local development through tourism. So um, sustainability in mountains and tourism, uh, protected areas, nature-based tourism, mountain tourism, that's my passion, that's um, my uh, my field of, of interest, my close to my my closest field of interest, and that's through that background that I'm here um, because I'm part of Canadian Mountain Network. Um, I um, uh, I'm a I'm a non-indigenous Quebecoise uh, partaking on this panel today, uh, uh, so from French heritage, um, and that puts me in a very delicate position. Uh, where my own culture and nation has uh, at the same time suffered and participated through uh, systems and, and, and dynamics of the colonial and federal history of Canada. And so um, it's with great uh, humility, but also uh, with 
pride also that I'm here and I thank everyone for having me and I'm uh, looking forward to our discussions. Thank you very much, Isabel. I'm now going to turn to Stephanie Yu. Binani Nicole, Ublami elders, panelists, academics, practitioners, lovers of mountains, and everyone else out there in the wild world of Zoom. This is a bit intimidating for me. Um, I'm fairly far away from everyone, so it's really excited to be part of this. My name is Stephanie Ewell, and I grew up near Ottawa, Ontario, on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. I'm currently a settler in the Nuvialuit Settlement Region. I live in Paolotuck, Northwest Territories, on the blizzardy shores of the Beaufort Sea. Many of you will think it lives on the tundra, on the barren lands. Well, it is barren lands. There's not a lot of trees up here, but I'm surrounded by beautiful rolling tundra hills. So I may not have the um, Adirondacks and I may not have the Rockies, but I certainly have this beautiful landscape that everyone should see but sustainably, of course, that's what we're here for. <clears throat> I'm very honored to be part of this panel for two reasons. One, I'm a mad tourist. I love being a tourist. Um, I have spent countless, areas, countless, countless hours in the back country all across the world and particularly in the Northwest Territories where I'm very fortunate to literally drink out of streams in the Richardson Mountains in the home of the Satu, Dene and Métis. I've been able to drink out of the East Arm um, close to Lutzelke. We have such a beautiful pristine environment up here. But I've also been fortunate to break bread with a lone shepherd in the Swiss Alps and be able to absorb and understand and experience other people's cultures. So that kind of tourism where I learn and I absorb is so important to me. And mountains are a part of the fabric of our humanity. They're so important. Like us, like humanity, they're constantly changing and adapting to their surroundings. And yet they remain so rooted in their place. Their stunning spaces and their remarkable people that live there remind us of the strength, resilience and beauty of nature, but also of the people that make mountains their home. I'm also really honored to be here because I'm a practitioner. I hold two degrees in tourism and parks management uh, from the University of Waterloo and Texas A&M. But after graduation, I followed the calling of environmental education, largely in parks. In search of the ever elusive full-time job, I went from Alberta Park, Ontario Parks, to Alberta Parks, to Texas State Parks, to Northwest Territories Parks, and now I reside um, with Parks Canada. So I've been at this over 20 years. I've been lucky, my job has been to raise awareness within people of the natural and cultural environments because for so long we separated them, but they're intimately intertwined. And I think that's been one of the gifts that I've been able to experience is, is bringing the two together and, and sharing that experience. In some cases, I've been able to help develop stewards of the environment um, as a settler, certainly working with other non-Indigenous people. But I've been really lucky because within my job, I've also been able to support, um, provide resources and work with people who are already stewardships, stewards and hold that close connection with the land. Time that I've spent on the land with elders and youth to help me more deeply experience and understand Indigenous people's ties to the land is providing me incredible guidance on how to make space for Indigenous voices and the importance of the culture of reconciliation. I'm currently the manager of Tuk Tuk Nurait National Park, where I work with a wonderful co-management board to manage our beautiful park and learn from my community the importance of reconciliation. I just want to close that I'm here representing myself. I'm representing the totality of my experience, my education and my career. I'm not here representing Parks Canada, but it's certainly part of who I am. Kuyanaini, Masicho, and I'm very looking forward to the next. Mute. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm now going to invite Kajislai, Kilslai Kajisting, apologies, Miles Richardson to introduce himself. <clears throat> I'm Miles Richardson. I'm from the Haida Nation. My my home nation is the same as Kiljus, Barb Wilson. Very 
proud of the work that she's bringing to to this table and has brought to this to this discussion about how we best give effect to our stewardship responsibility as the humans of our particular territories and have developed the modern approaches to to protecting and interacting with these areas in our respective nations as norma has pointed out and and others here that canada is is moving to to adopt that same stewardship ethic that have ensured that indigenous people have thrived in our territories for millennia for hundreds of generations and canada would do well to pick that up one one thing i want to spend my, uh, my time doing is 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 remembering um nigani aki anini our our can one of the conveners of reconciling ways and knowing that's elder dave korshain who's worked with myself and Nan dr nancy turner and david suzuki as the key conveners of reconciling ways of knowing bringing together a dialogue between indigenous traditional knowledge and science the basis of the western way of being and Dave Korshane has played a really key role in this initiative and, and I think with the success of bringing the two ways of knowing together when we were going to have this, when we had this dialogue scheduled, it happened on the day that he passed so we postponed the dialogue to today and I just want to take a moment to to remember him and remember what he always reminded us that that if we're going to be responsible stewards of, of our territories, if we're going to live the understanding that all of creation, including humans, are, are interdependent, then we're going to, we're going to, we're best served by doing those things and beginning with proper ceremony. And he, he was very strong on that and brought that knowledge forward from men, from every one of our nations. And I believe that's one of the reasons that we're still strong and thriving today. So let's just take a moment and remember Dave Corshane, um, the founder of Turtle Lodge, if you would, please. Thank you. How are? So no, that worked perfectly. I, I, it was really important to us, I think, to acknowledge Dave and now move into the dialogue. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Miles, for, yeah. for doing that. Thank you very much. So yeah, there are many common there are many approaches to sustainable tourism, some of them more common than others. Um, so to start on as much of a common foundation as possible, I'd like each of you to explain what culturally and environmentally sustainable tourism means to you. I'm going to ask Barbara to start us off. Sorry, I had myself on mute. Um, sustainable tourism, as I mentioned earlier, is, is an oxymoron to me. And I think about places like Fiji and in Hawaii and, and how um, they've been impacted and how my islands have been impacted by the um, coming and goings of people thinking that it's all right to come and take. So what we, what we want to do is, um, is find ways that people can come and visit and and learn what respect means in the context of the places that we're in. For many years, I wouldn't go to Hawaii because one of my uh, Kanaka friends said to me, if you love our lands, don't come. And that really hit home. And so when I look at 
tourism and the impact that it has on not just the land, but the people in all different parts of it. Um, I struggle. I struggle because I see um, if you don't have limits on how many people can come at it at a certain time, how the um, grounds get beat up, um, the lack of privacy that locals have. And that's not just First Nations, it's people who have um, pioneer or settler um, history with us and, and how hard that is on everybody because we used to be able to go to the beach, any beach, and have the family there and play all day. And now we have to move sideways and make room for, for visitors. So sustainable means that we're going to look after it for further for other generations. And so it means that not just the locals, but the especially the people who come to visit us um, need to know where they can go, how long is respectful and what what is acceptable in in cultural aspects so in in our homeland we have we have um potlatches and potlatches are the the final legal step in in uh, making something um known and it's a it's a private affair and so when people come to our homeland uh, we don't want people to think that they can just come because it's a traditional happening. It's, it's a very legal aspect of our world. And, and we, we want those kinds of things to be sustainable for our people and to be respected by people who come to our lands and not to come to our, our um, potlatches unless you're invited. So that would be sustainable for me. How well? Thank you, Barbara. Thank you for helping us understand the history and impact that we have in tourism. We're now going to turn to Bill Snow. Um, if you can help us understand what culturally and environmentally sustainable tourism means to you. Ishniash, uh, thank you. I think that, um, um, again, I would uh, agree with uh, Barbara that uh, we're dealing with, um, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, two sort of opposing ideas around uh, uh, what we see today as uh, uh, sustainability and, and tourism. Uh, and I would add in uh, conservation for that better. Yeah. I think that uh, here in um, uh, one of the projects that we're involved with is this uh, bison cultural study uh, that uh, began in 2017 uh, and is a, a five-year pilot study. Uh, and we're at the, uh, right now, um, uh, well, back in 2017, uh, the herd started out with uh, 16 head of buffalo that moved from the Elk Island National Park area uh, to the uh, 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 Panther Dormer sort of northeast section of Banff National Park. Uh, the herd's doing good. They're up to about 60 head and uh, they're adapting very well to their to their new home in the in the uh, in the Panther Dormer area. Uh, I think one of the things that we're trying to do uh, through this study is to better understand uh, uh, not only how, how wildlife are managed and how landscapes are managed, but I think we're also uh, 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 looking at and better understanding the, the traditional knowledge aspect. The traditional uh, knowledge aspect that's really missing from the program today, from the, the, the bison uh, reintroduction program. And I think we're we're in this uh, beginning phase of of bringing together these two worlds, world knowledge systems, these two worldviews, Western science and traditional knowledge. Uh, 
once we get to uh, a place where we can uh, have interaction, where we can bring both of those knowledge systems together, I think we can then look at ways of, 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 of it, the project really being sustainable over the course of time. That is not just dependent, we're not just dependent on science in, in how we manage herds or landscapes or the environment. We're looking at cultural practices as well. And I think that's the, the aim of a lot of indigenous uh, uh, study that's going on. Uh, and, and very much thankful to uh, the Canadian Mountain Network uh, for funding uh, these types of studies. Um, I know from my own experience, it's been very, very difficult to get uh, funding to do these types of studies, especially in the important uh, cultural and sacred places uh, on landscapes. Uh, so not a whole lot uh, in the last 100, even 50 years has been done on, on these traditional knowledge studies from, from the First Nations point of view. So uh, really timely and important, and it's good to see that that's happening. And good, it's good that the UN, with their declaration on the sustainable mountain development, I think it's timely that we're seeing uh, all of the work that's being done also within, within the Canadian Mountain Network. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Bill. Thanks for, for helping highlight for us that there's a really large gap in the history of being able to bring Indigenous knowledge to the forefront. I'm now going to turn to Isabel Falardeau to help us understand <coughs> what culturally and environmentally sustainable tourism is for her. Thank you. Um, so what it is to me, uh, I want to present in relation to, uh, and that's how uh, us uh, traditional scientists or scientists do, we look for definitions. And so, um, and we, uh, we have um, talked briefly about that amongst ourselves before. Um, if we see, if we look at what the, the official or institutional definitions of uh, sustainable tourism are, uh, we look at bodies like um, uh, the United Nations World Tourism Organizations or other institutions in Canada, for instance, and what they what they say is is it's the bringing together of three pillars in tourism: so economy, uh, culture, and environment. And at some at the meeting point of those three aspects is sustainability. Um, so that's that the ideal I, I I would say in the definition world, um, but the but what's what's more Im, important I think is what's the uh, uh, purpose and why why do these bodies use definitions and why do they uh, define uh, sustainable tourism like that and and to me when you read through through documentation um, it's not for sustainability of um, the planet of the society of the people it's for sustainability of tourism that's uh, the mission of of uh, united uh, nation world tourism organization is to make tourism important in 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 the in the world and so that's a big problem to me because um that's towards that goal that they will allocate or i'm really happy that they will say there's an international mountain tourism day or whatever and it's important i'm not uh saying we should reject all of that but if you're looking at promoting tourism not sustainable world then uh you're not uh able to make import or ask important questions and to me sustainability of tourism is not sustainability of the industry or the businesses is is how tourism can make the world can be an agent of change good or bad but can how can tourism make the world a better place and i'm not saying that's not part of what the official definitions are but uh, it's almost to me and that's how i thought of it when i was preparing today and and barbara said it in her own in the, in a different way but that's the same idea it's almost like uh the whole idea has to be shifted around and so um so 
um, and, and, and to reverse the thinking about it, the reverse what's the mean and what's the end. The mean is not tourism. It's not the economic gain from tourism. It's making people uh, uh, better, having a, an, an end environment. And so uh, when you say they don't go together, uh, they're an oxymoron, sustainable tourism. I, I think to me, uh, the more I think and study tourism and sustainable tourism, uh, the more elusive sustainable tourism becomes. Um, and um, um, yeah, that's that's what I wanted to. I, and so, yeah, um, the more unlikely even maybe it becomes. And, and like Barbara mentioned, since I've um, studied for now 10 years towards my PhD, I travel less and less, which is um, maybe uh, ironic <laughs> and maybe not uh, what we would wish for, but yeah, thank you. Thank you, Isabel, that you've brought up a really good point that we overlook often is um, how tourism can make the world a better place and in doing that sustainably. I'm now gonna turn to Stephanie Yule to help us understand what culturally and environmentally sustainable tourism means for her. Hi, hey, Nicole. Um, I'm just going to put a little proviso here. We're, we're just at the tail, we literally are at the tail end of a blizzard and I've lost you a couple of times. So I'm going to apologize in advance if, if I fade out, I'm really not ignoring you. Uh, Mother nature is taking control as she should. Sustainable tourism is something that I really, really struggle with. Um, going back to what um, Isabel said, I love traveling and I think I would shrivel up and die if I couldn't meet people and learn and grow. Um, I think I'm a much more empathetic, understanding, mostly patient person because of the variety of cultures and people that I've met over the last 55 years in one day, just so you know. Um, I think I'm a better person for it. But there's a big but, there's a big, big but when I first saw this question and it goes back um, to what Kielju and Barb, everyone's saying is there's a but. Um, when I first read this question, the very first thing that came to my mind, like Hawaii and like Fiji, was Cambridge Bay and some of the coastal communities in Nunavut and well, not so much the Northwest Territories, but the cruise ships that go up there. Um, on paper, it's you get to see the Arctic, you get to learn about what it's really like, you get to meet the people, you get to see the struggles against climate change and, and isolated living, and you get to see the joy of community and survival and togetherness. Um, but of course, cruise ships leave environmental damage. And one of the big problems is the people coming off those cruise ships and visiting the communities um, would often just, they wouldn't buy things. They, there was no real economic support for the communities that they were visiting. So really, what are the people of Cambridge Bay um, and other Nunavut particular communities getting out of these tourists? The tourists are getting a lot, which is, is lovely on one hand, but we want to ensure that tourism benefits the people of the area. So for me, sustainable tourism is, is that, that meeting that when I go to Okay, let's say when I go to Fiji, that I leave my money behind, that I purchase things, I make an economic contribution to the community I'm visiting, but I also make a knowledge contribution that I'm able to walk away from a community, I'm able to walk away from an individual meeting, from a potlatch, um, from wherever I am in the world, that I have an understanding of that culture, and that I can be an ally, I can be an advocate of that culture. Um, I also leave no trace, I'm not leaving any garbage, I'm leaving money instead. So it's this, this, this coming, be, this coming together of a community and a tourist where everyone benefits, not just the tourists and everything benefits, not just the tourists, but the trees, the mountains. So it's an elusive concept and I don't think we'll ever be perfect, but I think in my heart, I think it's something to work towards. And I think there's tools and things out there that can help contribute to sustainable tourism. And the one thing that makes that I think of is in Australia, there's an island called Hinchinbrook and they have a carrying capacity. You have to get, and it's like the um, Chilkoot Trail. 
only so many people can be on that trail at once because they recognize too much tourism is going to be detrimental to the environment. And so we just gotta have to figure that way out to so that the communities and the cultures also see that kind of benefit. So the search for tools to make it happen continues in my thoughts. Queen Aini Masicho. Thank you, Stephanie. We've heard a variety of perspectives from our first four panelists. And before we go um, further, I'm actually gonna return back to each of those panelists. And I'm gonna ask them to help answer some additional questions a bit differently for each of them to help us understand a bit more of what their experience has um, led them to now and how they see we can do things differently going forward. So I'm gonna go back to Barbara. Um, your, your wealth of knowledge and history um, and your, your, with your lands and, and people, what barriers um, do you face um, or are your indigenous people facing in participating in and shaping the direction of tourism and those sustainable and, and cultural practices in, in, in their territories? Do we lose Barbara? Oh, you're on mute. There, I did it. I'm I'm challenged when it comes to to the electronics. So um, barriers. I think one of the biggest barriers is is the lack of of um, having a say when when these places were originally set up. You know, you think about the types of things that have happened um, when it comes to economics, the idea that um, everything's there for the taking, you know, that that's not how our worlds work. And so when you look at the barriers, it's a, a governance barrier um, here on or on Haida Gwaii, uh, when when we were first working at at um, protecting what was called South Moresby at that time. Um, we looked at uh, Kilslai Kaji Sting, who was, our, who was our leader at that time. And he and the young people of our nation decided that there was enough logging happening in the area and the impact it was going to have on our food sustainability. So they, they woke the rest of us up and said, whoa, we got to stop this. And so they, they did a peaceful um, protest and they, they eventually saved the area, not without a lot of personal sacrifice. And they established in 1981, the, um, the, um, Haida Gwaii Watchman program, which was a volunteer program. And it was recognizing that we had to look after the area, which wasn't being looked after. It was just being, the trees were being removed, the fish were being removed, all our, our traditional foods were being impacted because of the, the fisheries law and the Indian Act. So the lack of governance, the lack of conservation, uh, the lack of being able to go out and use our lands because of the Indian Act, those things all had huge impacts and diseases. As you see today with COVID-19, um, our people were heavily impacted, the same as everybody's being impacted today. We went from more than probably about 30,000 people to less than 600. So the transference of our, of our knowledge to our youth um, through the impact of, of um, residential schools and, and other methods of, of separating us from our lands had huge impacts on the sustainability of, of our areas. And so I think that those barriers are barriers that we need to address today. The, the um, 
transgenerational impact of all that and the healing that needs to happen within all um, First Nations around the world is, is a very um, question that needs to be addressed and looked at because when you look at terra nullius and you look at doctrine of discovery and where it came from and what it's done to the world, um, it provides us with lots of food for thought and the, the kinds of barriers that have been put in front of any person that didn't um, have the same religious uh, way of, of um, saying hawa to the creator and or um, looking after the land. And so those are the barriers that I see um, that still prevail today, Hawa. Thank you, Barbara. I know you mentioned the role that Miles had in that history. Miles, did you want to take a moment to comment on that? Just, just look at how, how Kildews just cast this struggle. You know, if you think sustainable tourism is a is a oxymoron or it's competing forces, think of what she's saying and the forces behind those. Here we have a an indigenous way of knowing that's based on an understanding that we're one with the rest of creation. That's a fundamental knowledge that indigenous cultures share. And that our challenge as human beings is to live that and respect that as we go forward. And then you, you compare that for, for the purposes of this discussion with the Western way of knowing, which is science-based, but is also based on those, those concepts um, that she referred to as the doctrine of discovery and terra nullius, where indigenous people are not worthy humans, not, not, not human enough to have rights. And, and the struggle, struggle between those. But imagine if we, if we brought, did away with the untruths in this struggle, in that situation, and brought in this common human understanding and stewardship ethic of we're all interdependent. We're all in this together as humans and the rest of creation. I mean, imagine the possibilities then. You know, I remember the times Kildews is talking about when our people first started. You, you know, we're, we're, our people were facing the same thing the human race is facing today with, with, with climate change and biodiversity loss. It's, threat. it's, an, it's an existential threat. We're not going to survive this if we don't change. And I remember when our people were facing the prospect of cutting up, cutting all the trees. You know, our elders said they might as well move us to, to, um, to Europe or to, you know Siberia. Or so, you know, that if they if they change our landscape, our, our our life source like that, they might as well take us somewhere else. And so we got to stop. And we didn't know exactly. We we knew we had to do it. And I'll never forget. One thing that we did is for a hundred years, our people watched our, our title, our, our ownership of Haida Gwaii be, be ignored and pushed aside. In our old village sites, 40 villages were going back into the forest. People didn't live there all year round anymore. They were crumbling and, and going away. And our people started under our own authority started putting our own houses back up in our ancestral village site. You should have seen the effect of that simple act on our people. It was like, an, a, it was a, like a, a life jolt, an electrical jolt of life in our people that's continuing today. Just recognizing the truth and assuming that responsibility and Implementing that is still our objective. And, you know, we've run into problems along the way, but the trend and the push is still, still the same. And I think it's a human opportunity. It's something that we as humans need to do. That's our challenge in front of us. None of us on our own are gonna be able to do it. We've got to do it together and, and, and accept that, that 
stewardship ethic. Imagine if, if tourism became people in their place hosting visitors, if that's what it became. You know, instead of making their beds and serving them a cocktail, you welcomed them and you showed them who you are. You showed them your culture, your way of being, your way of interacting with your place. And you, and you showed them the natural features of your home and explained that, wouldn't, I mean, it would be awesome. There's so many opportunities along those lines and our, the, the experience of our people that Kildews is laying out is, is one option. Every one of us as indigenous people has our story of that, of that journey. We've got to adopt it as a human journey. Thank you, Awa. Thank you, Miles. There's there's a lot of great discussion being built here, and I'd like to have Bill help us further understand. Um, he's he's raised some also some really good examples of the work that is being done with the bison, and you know if if there if that or if there are other examples of what's being done right now. Um, whether it's tourism or sustainable uh, and, and conservation practices that are that are being brought forth again, how can we understand what's being done and and what impact that's having? Um, if you if you can speak about that. Uh, thanks, Nicole. Um, I think I'd like to talk a little bit about the barriers that exist, uh, uh, as was mentioned, uh, and I fully agree with. Uh, with Miles and Barbara on uh, the the lack of uh, voice and participation uh, that Indigenous people have had on in their in their own areas and traditional lands, um, the only thing I would add to that is uh, one of the barriers is uh, is a lack of cultural awareness, especially regarding our histories of uh, Indigenous people. Uh, for for my for my uh, for, for my area and and, uh, and my First Nation and people here in Treaty Seven, uh, which was signed in 1877, we our people our elders understand the treaty as a sharing of land, and whereas government looks at it as a land sale, so we've had miscommunication right from the start. From, from 1877. Uh, and then we get into a, a very repressive uh, policy period beginning in 1884. Uh, I believe one of the first uh, restrictions around culture was the, was the uh, banning of the pot, potlatch in, in BC and continued straight on into the 1960s uh, with other uh, repressive policies. The one that really impacted uh, Stony uh, was the removal of Stony from Bath National Park in the early 19th and the early 20th century. Uh, that really uh, prevented and uh, it ostracized and it it, uh, it crippled the way that we uh, interact with the land and and with each other. Uh, it had a really crippling effect. On our ancestors, and 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 that crippling effect is is what reverberates today in our communities. So that's why I believe uh, 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 events like the Banff Indian Days uh, that began in the late 18, 1880s, that event was a way for Stony to still get access to their traditional areas, even though it was. Uh, it was a, a tourism event that was superficial. Uh, it it in a, uh, in a very uh, uh, in a very real way it reconnected us to our land. And so, while at the same time uh, we were experiencing all of these repressive policies, we were also helping the local economy in building the tourism industry uh, here in southern Alberta. Uh, first with the railway and then with uh, with helping out the um, early explorers and finding their way through the mountains. And then uh, finally in, in, in helping to build a lot of the tourism uh, uh, infrastructure 
that is now part of what the experience is in uh, Mount Assiniboine, the, the mountain there behind you, uh, all those pathways leading from Bath National Park, uh, Lake Louise, the Kicking Horse Pass, uh, many of the areas that we know today uh, world renowned uh, were assisted by stony, early stony people in, in taking visitors and taking uh, early mountain explorers to these uh, very unique, uh, culturally significant places. Uh, so a lot of barriers that people don't know about the uh, uh, indigenous history, indigenous mountain history. And I would say that, uh, so that's a barrier that when people don't know that, uh, whether they be tourism or conservation people. Uh, uh, so that's one step that needs to be uh, worked on. And and I think that's why, you know, uh, I've tried to, um, uh, the only way we're gonna combat ignorance is with education. And so we need to get out these histories, <laughs> these, uh, uh, these kind of discussions, but we also need to do the, the reporting as well the traditional use studies that talk about these areas and impart uh, knowledge that is important. Um, one of the, the good things I think that is going to come out of our report uh, on the bison study that we currently have, I think is the recognition that uh, wildlife have a place on the landscape and not just an environmental function, but a cultural function. And when we look at, uh, we look around almost everywhere today, we see uh, impacts of climate change, uh, most notably in BC uh, in this past uh, few years. I think that uh, the more that we understand the impact of that wildlife have on landscapes, uh, the more important an issue that is. Uh, bison do, do things on landscapes that we as human beings cannot do. And so just by them being there, they are supportive of other forms of life, not just the, the other ungulates and, and uh, insects and, and avian species, but the vegetation itself. So they are really hallmarks of a, a rebuilding landscapes, rebuilding biodiversity. And so I think that's true of many, many different areas uh, all across Canada. And I think that, uh, and, and especially mountains. And so when we take, when you take a species like uh, bison off the landscape for a hundred years, that landscape is less. So by putting bison back on landscapes, you have, uh, you have that restorative nature, not only environmentally, but culturally. So I think that's one of the things that is important to keep in mind uh, and understanding all of those impacts that bison have on landscapes, we can't understand all of those impacts just with Western science. We have to use traditional knowledge to acknowledge those types of impacts. And again, bringing, bringing together these knowledge systems is, is important. But first, I think we have to get through and acknowledge those, those two different systems as being uh, separate and independent, uh, different ways of knowing. Uh, so again, the, the barriers are understanding that cultural awareness aspect, bringing it up to today, what can we do? Projects like the, the reintroduction, the cultural study, not only understanding the Western science side of it, but the traditional knowledge side of it as well. Yes, thanks. Thank you, Bill. We're getting into some some really broad, but and also really huge educational territory with our discussions today. I'm going to turn to Isabel now. We're talking about sustainable tourism practices and historic uses of land, and what we're what we're doing now in science and indigenous knowledge systems being different and, and science is, um, as Isabel had, had touched on, uh, more systematic in, in approach. And so from science um, perspective and, and, and Isabel with the, the history that you have so far and the work that you're doing, um, what, what do you see um, uh, that can be done to start bringing together 
science um, and maybe locally in your region um, and with your experiences um, with, with the peoples and, um, and understanding the land and differently and working together differently. Do you have an experience or thoughts that you can share on um, what's being done around you, what you're doing to help us build these relationships together? Yeah, sure. Thanks for uh, the question. Um, I'm gonna uh, use an example of how of of um, how different ways of knowing are also part of science. Um, so science is really diverse, anyways. But um, I think that one um, really beneficial and 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 really contributing. Um, aspects or, or element about considering different ways of knowing. So whether it's indigenous or non-indigenous or, or other uh, opposing ways of, of building knowledge is, is bringing into, the, into light something that's not uh, often, or that's not enough acknowledged in science is that there is perspective in science. <laughs> there is, um, non-rational in science, even in hard science uh, that I would argue. And, and so, excuse me, through uh, the research project we do with uh, Canadian Mountain Network and then I'm part of, um, we're based out of uh, the Mount Arford area, which is a, a small mountain in um, Southern Quebec. And um, one of the sources of information that for me uh, was a breaking point in that project, but is now also a very important part of how I conducted my thesis, for example, is this movie, this documentary called, and the, the, the title's in French, Le Vieil Indien. Uh, and so it would translate to the old Indian, I would uh, assume. Uh, and it was made by Marty uh, Knada Takus Meunier, which is, um, uh, he's a resident of the Mount uh, Orford area from indigenous, uh, 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 he's indigenous himself. He's also a scientist, but he's an artist. And he, so he made this movie. And in this movie, he um, uses art uh, and he brings in his art, he brings together science, history, um, poetry, uh, images, of course, to, um, uh, to make his point and to contribute to the understanding of, of, uh, of Mount Arford. And, and his work is a testament. He's honoring Mount Arford, the history, the ecosystem, the artists, um, the different heritages that are um, intertwined in the area. So indigenous people, um, uh, but also people from French speaking and English speaking heritage. And that's uh, really like, it's really embodied in, in his uh, movie. And to me, it is very, it's really touching because the word or the title, Le Vieil Indien, is meant to rest, the, that was the name that some people, French uh, heritage people gave to the mountain. Um, in the past because they would see a silhouette in it, but it's also um, referring to the main character of the movie who's, uh, was, who's, um, who was expropriated, whose family was taken away from the land when they created the national park. That's some of the uh, themes that Bill mentioned and, and it's happened to, uh, and it's happened and it's happening to people from, um, all around the world, including um, here, uh, of course. Um, so, um, so through, through uh, tapping into art uh, and into these intertwined ways of knowing embodied in that movie, I recommend you watch this movie if you're interested. I don't know if probably you can find it, find the movie subtitled. Um, but that to me is in, in itself a really great example of how art can contribute to science and and how different ways of knowing can come together to uh, really be great uh, tool for um, transmitting knowledge and at all uh, levels. And, and I will finish with that. Uh, more interestingly, that movie is uh, put um, available on the, on the internet for free through uh, Tourism Memphrey Magog, which is the, the local uh, destination, tourism destination um, marketing body, if I would say. So 
um, that's a contribution of tourism um, to knowledge and to uh, and and to using that diversity uh, towards a good and and that was um, um, the desire of the artist that it would be accessible for free and and so um, yeah that was one example that I wanted to use to uh, illustrate how um, that touch uh, how different ways of knowing touch my life and my work. Um, and, and the other um, really, um, I think, inspiring um, I, element I would mention is I am also, a, I teach uh, tourism classes. And uh, in my classes, students um, are amazing. They're an amazing source of knowledge for me. And we're able to build together. And they're really interested in uh, diversity. And that includes um, so in my tourism classes, indigenous tourism and indigenous uh, contribution is one of their preferred or most um, sensitive and, and, and close to their heart subjects. And so just recently we had a conference with people from a regional park who's putting forward a, develop, a development project and they brought to the discussion uh, some uh, contradictions in the way Indigenous peoples whose traditional territories are concerned by this project are not systematically involved. And um, I think that's a great contribution to also different uh, so from the, the students, so the, the future generations. And um, I thought that that was one of the ways that, in my experience, uh, it gives me hope, I guess, that we're uh, making some progress. Thank you, Isabel. I'm now going to turn to Stephanie, and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna change the question a little bit. So I hope I don't throw her for too much of a loop here. But we're we're hearing today a lot about what we need to do um, to support in, Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous people in. Um, as stewards of the land and in sustainability and conservation, um, but we have, we still have this this role of the tourist and um, you know individuals and, and people as we go out on, on on the land and we experience the land um, not just in Canada but elsewhere, and lands that maybe historically have been cared for by by other people for millennia. Um, and so Stephanie, you had touched on your travels and experiences with a lot of enthusiasm and, and how you've approached tourism and, and those experiences. So maybe if you could help us, um, you know, help us understand or, or, you know, give us some ideas as, as we go out into the land and we start um, on our, our travels as tourists, um, what can we do? Um, what can we do to help um, change our approach and our, our views and our relationships um, as we explore the land um, and um, and and learn learn through those explorations? Um, what what kind of guidance could you give us from your experience? Well, so much for all my notes, Nicole. I know you touched, uh, you know, you touched on something and I think we're, you know, we've got some great history, but um, we need to um, give our audience some ideas on how okay. they can start approaching tourism. And I think you've been doing that. It goes back to me to education and exposure. And it goes back to starting with younger kids. Like I'm going to go back to barriers for a second because it does play into what I'm thinking about. But one barrier that I came to was technology. I have hosted, organized, coordinated dozens and dozens of traditional knowledge and culture camps or science and culture camps. And they're wonderful experiences. People would pay thousands of dollars to have these kind of experiences. And you know how hard it is to get the kids off their phones, to get off PUBG, to get off FaceTime, Instagram, whatever they need. And so that makes me sad for the future. Like, how are we going to get young people as they grow up? How are we going to get them interested in human beings? How are we going to get them interested in exploring the world beyond PUBG and that little three inch by eight inch or whatever? of their phones. So I think that's one of the things is 
Isabel, thank you so much for, for being a professor. Like I think at the university and college level, that's wonderful. We, we've got people going into tourism and, and having that, that critical knowledge of it. But I think there's room when we're talking with the younger students in school is opening them up to other cultures, other worlds, but also starting with Canada and, and going to our history. Um, and maybe, and I don't wanna say we need to have a tourism course um, in schools, but maybe there's ways to get them out on the land and get them culturally knowledgeable about their own communities. And I think the Northwest Territories actually does do a really good job of it. Our schools, take the youth out and this is from like small communities of 300 people to Yellowknife and they engage them with the local and so this is indigenous and non-indigenous particularly in the larger communities and so you've got these wonderful opportunities for young people to go into a safe space ask questions that maybe youth aren't always comfortable asking um, when you've got the opportunity to go one-on-one -on -one with an elder it's a great opportunity to learn more. So I think by creating more of these opportunities for youth um, in the elementary school and the high school, we will slowly start growing people that have um, a wider base, a wider curiosity of the world around them. And again, it goes back to incorporating that with th that environmental education. So getting youth to spend time on the land to me is one of the most important things that we can do within the education system and the funding's a barrier technology is a barrier but there's definitely ways to get around that and one other thing that i really do appreciate and unfortunately it's not sustainable tourism but the, a lot of the youth in the northwest territories have some pretty amazing opportunities there's northern youth abroad which is incredible so We've got two youth here in Palatuck. And Palatuck's only a community of 300 people. We only have two flights in a week. So we're a pretty remote, isolated place. We have two young, wonderful gentlemen, or high school students, that are going to Ottawa as part of Northern Youth Abroad. So they're going in a safe, they've got chaperones, they've got people to meet. So those kind of opportunities, and they're able to bring home their experiences, but they're also able in a safe spot the people they encounter when they go to Ottawa to educate them about the Inuvialuit history and, and where they live and what they do is, is magnificent. Um, and we also have a really amazing program in the Northwest Territories called the Youth Ambassador Program. And so make, and what happens is we gather 50 youth from across the Northwest Territories and they come down here, well, they come to Yellowknife and they get about a week's worth of training. And the training is communication. It's about tourism, it's about customer service, it's about traditional games. Um, and what happens is those 50 youth or 25 or however many, when there's a big event, so some of the youth ambassadors that I've trained got to go to the Olympics. They get to go to, to the summer games, like they travel and they take their culture with them and, and they're there to educate people and also learn. So I think providing those kind of opportunities for that cultural exchange, um, I, I think exposing people to different cultures through programs like on the land camps, through Northern Youth Abroad um, and cultural exchanges like that benefit everyone. It's not always sustainable, but hopefully we can develop younger people and educate them to be sustainable as they grow older. Um, I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to now turn to a couple of questions from the audience. So I hope we have, we've got a little bit of time left here before we have Miles and Norma help us wrap this discussion up. But Barbara, we've had a question come in. Given that protecting the natural beauty of places like Haida Gwaii requires staying away, do you believe there's a role for virtual tourism whereby people are able to see and enjoy the sensitive environmental and cultural areas without negative impacts? What could that look like? Uh, thank you for the question. I, I think there is a place uh, for virtual tourism, we, we had to adapt our way of looking at things, um, as, as we know, because of COVID. And so and this, this electronic world that we're, we're doing this talk in shows you 
the possibilities. And I think that doing um, university courses and that Isabel has, has spoken about and uh, being able to show people uh, things we have on Hide It Why, we have young people who are involved with, with um, making films and recording our history so that with permission, with the agreement of our people, those kinds of things could be shown such as our governance. We have uh, the Council of the Haida Nation, all those different aspects of Haida Gwaii could be made available. We have a um, communications department in the Council of the Haida Nation, and we have the Skidigat Band Council and Old Massive Village Council, and they all have um, communications or people who can put those kinds of things together. And But I'm not against tourism. I'm not against people coming to Haida Gwaii. What I'm against is, is the disrespect that comes very often with it. You know, I've traveled, I travel quite extensively um, around the world and, and I have a real appreciation for, for um, the people who open um, their parts of the world. And, and I think that respect is the thing that needs to be built and asking permission first, you know, think about it. It's our home, we open our doors. How would you want your home treated? If this was your house, how would you want your house treated? And if you take a look at, at these places where we've lived for thousands and thousands of years, remember it's our house and I wouldn't want you coming to my house and throwing your garbage on my floor or, or taking all my food out of my fridge or um, just trashing places. We love our land, we love our ocean. We wanna have it for future, for future generations. So if you think about it in that aspect, and yeah, we could open the window and let you look in through electronics. And, and that might do it, but, but think about respect and think about what disrespect does. Hawa, thank you. Barbara, I have another question here now. I'm gonna direct to Bill. You talked a lot about your experience and the Bison um, reintroduction and uh, those projects. What what else uh, and and the need for funding and what else would make it possible for other indigenous groups to partner with canadian governing bodies or other groups um, for sustainable tourism planning uh thanks um <clears throat> i think there's uh, uh one uh one piece that that's helpful uh going to be helpful is we have to reimagine tourism. Uh, tourism really comes from a colonial mindset of, of, you know, we do one thing on this at this place. We do our learning over here. We do our work over here. It's all very siloed the way that we look at land in a from a Western science perspective. And so when I say that we have to reimagine tourism, we have, we also have to reimagine conservation. Uh, and I think that's that's where we are at the very tip right now in terms of uh, understanding those two world knowledge systems, the Western science piece and the traditional knowledge uh, piece. Uh, uh, tourism has uh, uh, done, uh, turned a lot of sacred sites into uh, uh, money-making ventures, uh, many times at the cost of uh, the the cultural and spiritual aspect of how indigenous people see see landscapes and and see their their traditional lands. Uh, so, 
before we get too far down about trying to find that solution for tourism, uh, I think what needs to come first is we need to have, we need to reimagine tourism, we need to reimagine and understand and basically come to a new found respect for land, respect for waters. Um, the, a lot of places, especially in the mountain parks, uh, these are life-giving water sources for all of us. And yet we treat them like swimming pools or fishing ponds. And I don't think it should be that way, but that's the way it is. Um, and so before we get to all of the, the center, the focus around, you know, how do we solve tourism? I think what, what we, there's a lot of good things uh, at different stages that are happening, uh, especially on the co-management side. I think that we've heard, heard here today. Uh, but I think for, uh, uh, for projects like the, the bison reintroduction, I think the first step that needs to come in place is healing for the land, healing for the wildlife, healing for the people. We'll figure out tourism later. That's, that's not the driver of what keeps us alive. Economically, it keeps us alive. But I think, uh, especially now, what we're seeing with the, with the effects of COVID, we're seeing so many people uh, move and try and get into the uh, provincial parks, federal parks. They're looking for that uh, reconnection to land to sustain their 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 own uh, wellness and well-being. So I think that uh, there's lots of opportunities for tourism, especially with indigenous groups, indigenous peoples. There's ways to do uh, indigenous tourism, but I think that cannot come at the cost of of ignoring everything else. So for, for myself, uh, what needs to come first is that healing aspect. Uh, this is why we were doing ceremonies uh, at Stony. We were doing ceremonies in recognition of the, the bison reintroduction years before it started. Uh, this is why we continue to do ceremonies uh, at events like Banff Indian Days. Banff Indian Days today is not what it was back in the late 1800s. It is today, it's a cultural event where we connect with our youth, connect with our elders, where we get to spend time in a be beautiful place just outside of the town, the town of Banff, uh, Minerpa, the waterfalls. That's what we call that area. We go there to remember, we go there to reconnect with nature. The, the tourism part will come at some point, but it, what what needs to happen first is our reconnection to the land, healing for the land, ensuring that uh, th those those connections and that respect is there. Uh, in my mind, that's that's kind of where we're at. There's a lot of different kind of solutions around indigenous tourism. Uh, everything from sharing languages to uh, place names, understanding place names from the many places that do not, the place names that do not represent what the indigenous people understand those places are. Uh, as I said, uh, there's opportunities for well-being, uh, forest bathing and that sort of thing. Uh, there are ways to, to show that uh, how forests are being uh, more properly managed that I think people would be interested to see. I think there's ways to uh, incorporate uh, uh, visioning and seeing places uh, virtually, as we've talked about. Uh, and there's a host of other uh, uh, areas and services that, that could be part of our, the tourism experience. Right now, today, you know, we have you go into downtown Bath into a gift shop and most of the merchandise is, is made somewhere else and imported into Canada. So we're living in a, in a cult in a colonial system. And that colonial system is, can only move in, around so much. 
So the bringing in these traditional knowledge aspects, this understanding is going to take time. Uh, it's important that we we relook at landscapes, reimagine tourism, reimagine conservation. Uh, we need to do it soon because there's impacts happening that I think that we all see like climate change that are going to affect us all. Uh, thanks, Ishnish. Thank you very much, Bill. I'm now going to turn, we have so many questions from the audience and I apologize, we, we will not have time to, to, for the rest of them. What I really think is important now is that we have our two conveners representing our two organizations, Canadian Mountain Network and Reconciling Ways of Knowing. Uh, um, join us in the panel with some, some final thoughts and some wrap up comments and some perspective from their experiences as, as well. So I'm going to turn to Norma Cassie. Um, if you can share your thoughts with us and experiences on um, conserving cultural and natural heritage um, through sustainable tourism and, and through the work that you've done. Norma's on with us still. Yeah, thank you. What an interesting discussion so far. People have touched on so many things. Um, I just want to... Um, bring it back to you know how Dave and Miles and David Suzuki and you know a little bit of Canadian Mountain Network and had worked to create this forum to discuss um, and bring Indigenous knowledge uh, through this forum um, reconciliation reconciling ways of knowing and I think that a lot of that came out today I come from uh, the North Yukon, way up there in the high Arctic. And um, we, every, not in the very early times when people, explorers came, um, then our people were always so welcoming. We welcomed anyone who came into our place. And our community right now is there's 250 people approximately. And, um, and it's, of course, we all look at our homelands as the most beautiful places on earth because, you know, they're our homelands and we were born there and they are very, very, very uh, connected to who we are because we're connected to our homelands and our, our biodiversity. And, um, and it's also a fly-in community. And some of the um, tours that come in, and we, do have, we have no tourist facilities. We do have a couple of hotels and people have started things. But it's uh, um, people come in and they're embraced by our community and they're given good food, they taste our food, and they're, they're told stories and things like that when they do come into our community. And then, then there's um, people that who are starting now to create, you know, dog team rides and go, go watch the Northern Lights, which, which are really sacred to us. And they're learning about those things as they come. And I think uh, when we think of, we, we use the word sustainability of tourism, I think where we're at right now is um, the sustainability of Mother Earth. Mother Earth is really, really tired. The garbage that's all over her, the, the, the things that are going on on this planet, the crisis that we are in right now really makes me think about, you know, the some of the panel members talking about bringing the youth together and educating them and having that responsibility to work together. The Indigenous Leadership Initiative um, in Canada has been working for years now that Miles and I are a part of and many incredible leaders from across the country, Indigenous leaders have, Dave Cruchain was one of them as well to, to begin the discussions of protecting and in creating um, land-based guardians and uh, indigenous protected areas. And uh, so this is growing across the country and in the, at, in the process of reconciliation in this country, um, we need to clean up. We need to have land back. We need to um, take over those territorial parks and the parks surrounding our systems and be able to, to, to help with our guardians, clean them up, take good care of them and begin to um, uh, um, really get, get them to flourish now within our regions. The waters are so important. 
we need to look very carefully at cleaning those up as well. And I think our land guardians um, that are that have been uh, growing now in this country is very, very important part of how we were land guardians for thousands of years. And, um, and then it was taken away from us. And then now we're, we're coming back. We're now into self-governing entities and we want to grow these land guardians across the country. And, and as Canada and the United Nations come together to protect more area in this country, I think all, this, all these um, things that we've done to Mother Earth is now time to clean up and really tread on her lightly from now on, like not just go in there and like really be tourists and not have the, not hear and listen to what is reconciliation. What does reconciliation mean to me and you? And let's really reconcile with mother earth and each other and, and start doing that because time is of the essence really uh, at where we're at right now. We're in a huge pandemic also that, uh, that's going to affect our health and well-being. Sustainability of tourism is going to be like Bill said, it's just going to be back there. If we want to sustain ourselves, I think it's a, a collaboration between everyone in this country is very, very important to protect our lands and what we have left now. We need to clean up. And uh, this takes everyone who has a res responsibility for these lands. We need to clean up our homelands and, um, and bring back the community of Mother Earth again and, and, and start, um, you know, make bring hope for the young people, for the future generations, um, protect more land, protect more forests, keep them clean and protect the biodiversity that we already have right now or we, that we have, like reintroducing bison. It was, it was a horrible experience for Bill and his people to go through the decimation of the entire plains of buffalo that had used to wander their lands now and they're bringing those back. And those are um, very inspiring stories and inspiring things that indigenous peoples are still trying to do and to protect large tracts of land where there's caribou and there's and, um, and, and animals and biodiversity and birds all along the, the um, forested areas from Mexico right to the Arctic. You know, those are things that, um, that can be done can be worked towards so that in collaboration with everyone, because the indigenous peoples always stood for that. We always stood and fought in the front lines for those kinds of things to protect our homelands. We welcome people like we always have, but we you need to learn our protocols. You need to learn how sacred that the land you walk on is is um, is how sacred that is and how gentle that we need to be. With, um, with our planet now uh, and going forward. So I think that, you know, we touched on many subjects here and, um, and we, we always work really hard to do that. The Canadian Mountain Network, um, a few years ago in 2016, we put in an application. I was invited to be a part of that. And we decided that we were really gonna fight for indigenous knowledge to be at the forefront of research. And we fought and we got $18.3 million and we opened the doors for indigenous peoples to finally apply to this grant to do research in collaboration with others if they choose. And, um, and now in, hubs are created. People are looking at the caribou herds. They're looking at their salmon. They're looking very seriously at their buffalo. They're trying to open up little creeks where there's cities surrounding them so the trout can continue to swim up to their reservations. Those are the kinds of research that we're doing now. And all we want is uh, collaboration with indigenous peoples to save these areas and this planet for your life and your future generations as well. And we, 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 we continue from that all the time. So like, um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of work to be done, but it doesn't have to be that hard. We just need to work in collaboration and work like we have the answers for sustainability going forward. And I think that um, that's what we need to do in every aspect. We're talking reconciliation now. This is very hard. And what we're going through right now as Indigenous peoples with unearthing our babies and, and things like that, like this is really, really hard for us. It's bringing up a lot of pain and um, 
there's time when we got to walk together and take care of our land and sustainability of tourism is is a small part of that but if we want people like if people want to come visit our homelands learn about us learn with us learn our culture our spirituality touch a little bit of it we're open to educating youth uh, from all diversity and uh, so yeah i just want to um say that masito thank you very much norma i'm now going to turn to miles and have him join in with his thoughts on our time together today. Miles. Jeez, we should have had another hour. We have so um, many unanswered questions. <laughs> you know, when, when, when we're t dissecting or d discussing the way forward on, on concepts like sustainable tourism, um, you know, I think Bill said it really well that we, we need to reimagine our concepts of tourism and even conservation. The way we deal with those two concepts now comes from a Western mindset. And it was our, it was our intention in setting up this dialogue that we brought in the indigenous way of knowing and the Western science way of knowing because we need them both, but to have a serious, equal level dialogue between them to figure out the way forward. And, and you know, I really um, uh, congratulate the Canadian Mountain Network for pushing this particular dialogue because today's discussion has been so rich in terms of ways forward and opportunities to define in, in, a, in a broad and meaningful way how we might address this notion of sustainable tourism. But we need to do that. We need to step back and reimagine both terms. And, I, and, and a, key, a key to that is, is gonna be, and one of the most effective ways that, that I've observed of, of doing that and addressing that is to realize that when we're talking about human societies, and, and how we relate to each other in, in the context of our worlds and th those, those relations between all of creation that indigenous people bring to the table, we need to, we need to look at it from that perspective and take advantage of the, of the power and insight that focusing on specific situations and specific relationships that science brings us that we bring those together and and um, really look at what's the right way forward but inevitably it's going to come back to how how we respect each other and how we relate to each other in terms of a governance sense you know that's essentially what our experience in the Haida nation when we didn't like the way our islands were being treated that um, um, taking all the just ripping out all the resources without any regard for the future or what the values of the people there are we we just had we had this stop that was the only option we had but we we've got we've got to keep all those considerations on on the on the table and as we come to an agreement on the values and principles that are going to guide our decisions on the objectives to which we're managing human activity for which is the only activity we can realistically have a chance of managing that we've got we we've got to do that in in a consensual way by by straightening out our governance and right now you know canada has has committed to a nation to nation relationship it's the right thing to do. And First Nations need to step forward. And Indigenous people are capable of this. You know, the most effective changes toward responsible stewardship that I've seen have been by Indigenous people stepping forward under their own authority, whether it be their own inherent continuing title or what their, their, their perception of treaty rights, that, that Indigenous people step forward and assert the proper way of being, assert the proper way of being based on their way of knowing. 
And you know, you can call it, that's what happened with, um, Barb referred to it as the English name, South Moresby, Guayanas, which that's what our people did. We got tired of trying to negotiate. We just stepped forward and protected the area under our own authority. Soon the crown came around and made a nation to nation agreement with us. I see that happening across the country today. I see up in the Northwest Territories with the uh, Eastern Dene from Lustoke have said, we're gonna protect Thai, Thai Dene Nene, a huge part of their traditional territory and said, we're gonna protect it under our authority, Canada. We're welcoming you to join us. And they found a vehicle that worked for them an amended national park approach. It's a beautiful example. They're building an economy based on it. They're protecting their area. I see the Chilcotin have declared tribal park. I've seen the New Channels have declared tribal park here in BC. And there's many, the Buffalo Initiative in Alberta where they're just going forward and bringing back the Buffalo, which is an essential relationship to them. We can do these initiatives under our own steam, under our own authority. You know, we get groups like the Canadian Mountain Network and other allies across this country and internationally who, who have shared those common values and objectives for us. We can muster enough force to make these changes. The proof is there. It's, it's begun in Canada as just in the last fed, federal budget has put in place two and a half billion dollars to help these sustainability initiatives. That's a, the first show of some seriousness that Canada has shown to believing in and committing to this indigenous stewardship ethic. We need to build on that. We need to take the initiative in our places, find allies and, and build out these, these um, projects in a way. Look, look at the, the indigenous leadership initiative has, has pushed for the establishment of a national indigenous guardians network. Pay attention to that. Support indigenous nations who are building their own guardians programs. Support indigenous conserved and protected areas that Canada has put into. There's resources there that'll, that are gonna enable nations to come forward. And, and you're gonna see huge opportunities and tourism could, you know, we'll refer to it as an economic component or an economic initiative. It's gonna end up being much bigger than just economic. It's gonna be cultural and spiritual and, and, and you know, just, just a reminding each other of how we relate, we relate to our places. But, but there was a question earlier, I'm trying to fit too much in now, um, there was a question earlier about virtual tourism. Is there any hope for that? You know, in Haida Gwaii, we started figuring, we, you know, once we got control over our islands and the values by which we related to it, we figured we needed to tell our story as Haida's about our culture and our place ourselves. We built a cultural center and in, in um, in Kailanagai and in, in near Skidigat in Haida Gwaii. And we were gonna just, you know, bring in scientifically trained curators and cultural scientists. And then we decided our own people are capable of telling our own story. And it's the best thing we ever did, I think. Brought in our own people as curators, our own people to bring visitors through the exhibits our own people to prepare our stories, prepare the information and, and deliver it to the visitors. And there's no reason that the, that information couldn't be put online. And all the challenges we have in fisheries and in land management or land and sea relations, we can share that with the rest of the world virtually. People can learn about us and we can learn about others without even having traveled. And if we do get lucky enough to travel to each other's territories, we can do it with, you know, having been briefed, having some intelligence about these other people's view of the world. And we can really then I think see how much we really do have in common. What an exciting conversation. Obviously I wish we had much more time and we, we will. Let's Canadian Mountain Network, Indigenous Leadership Initiative, 
all those on this on this webinar today. Let's continue to build these relationships toward these objectives that we've discussed today, that we've shared. We've built a really strong foundation to do that. Thanks for participating. How are? How are? Thank you, Miles. And I want to say thank you to all our speakers and attendees for sharing your time and wisdom with us today for this conversation. Tourism is, tourism is such a broad topic and it has different meaning and practice for many people. And tourism is place-based. Indigenous people are the ancestral caretakers and knowledge holders of the lands that many seek for tourism. And with COVID, that is obviously really increased as the world seeks to heal and survive during these times. So today we came together to start the discussion on what is really the tip of the iceberg on the topic of conserving cultural and natural heritage through sustainable mountain tourism. We're now going to turn to Gudia. He's going to help us close our time together in a good way. Thank you. When we look at um, how we are raised up on the land, uh, we never take more than what you need. And you take only what you need to survive for yourself, for your family, and uh, you leave others that live on that land the ability for them to care for themselves and care for their family as well. Right now we had some very big snow up here uh, in uh, this part of, of, of the world. Um, we haven't seen snow like this for a while. Um, last year we had uh, enough snow that it, it flooded um, areas uh, within the Yukon River system on the upper headwaters of the Yukon. And um, this year there's a concern because of the amount of snow that is on the ground, uh, again, of, of flooding. So we're, we're, we're faced on a daily basis with these kind of, uh, of, of thinking and uh, of this kind of snow. I can't go out on the land without having a good pair of snowshoes because the snow is up to my, uh, um, uh, up to almost my waist. I have to figure out um, um, bringing a shovel and I have to have sand in my, in my vehicle if I travel. Um, these are expected things that I am I'm, I'm dealing with in my life and others as well. Um, what is unexpected is um, the continuation of um, how we're going to um, um, deal with uh, the, this pandemic that we are in globally. Um, we're living in a time when um, the Earth nation have and are taking extraordinary measures to, to care for their, their people, uh, care for their communities, care for their businesses. Um, uh, we should also have um, um, the time to reflect as we're sitting at home, as we're looking at new ways to, to conduct businesses within our communities, within our nations. And uh, look at our ingenuity, our adaptability uh, in finding new ways. Uh, we are not here uh, without those abilities. Uh, we have evolved to where we are right now within our nations, within our communities, and we will continue to, to evolve and, and carry on. Look at your, your uh, uh, businesses and its role in your communities and um, how, it, uh, uh, how that vision of uh, short-term and, and long-term um, um, how it fits into uh, um, that thinking within your nation of, of seven generations up, a, up ahead. Um, when we look at terms of sustainable uh, ecosystems and uh, sustainable uh, tourism within those ecosystems, uh, we look at uh, the, uh, the benefits and impacts. 
uh, but we also need to look at um, um, the goodness that um, um, uh, each other offers when we provide hope um, to how we would like to continue to move ahead within our time here on earth and care for the land and the waters that they have hope as well. Kahu, good, show me then, finish. Thank you, Gudia. And thank you all for joining. We are honored to have shared this experience with you today. Good day. Take care, everyone. Shnish, thank you, everyone. Masi Cho. Bye, everyone. Stay safe, Take everyone. Care. Thank you. See you all in a few minutes.